identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. The traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion of it. Uh, moved very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go. Why could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. EWA-517, do you want to report a UFO? Over. Negative. We don't want to report. Look, it won my worst Wednesday night. Good evening, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis and... Hey, this is Mark Jackson. How is everybody? Hey, Smiles. Doing good, Mark. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, nice to, to be together on another Wednesday night for this live edition of Anomaly Now, straight out of Austin, Texas, the weekly live news roundup show of the 501c3 Anomaly Archive Scientific Anomaly Institute, the nonprofit that I founded 20 years ago in 2003, this is our 20 year year anniversary. And congratulations, Ed. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, and man, uh, you know, again, m folks who are familiar with me or you or this podcast, uh, and the, the Anomaly Archives are, are familiar that you know it's it's we, you and I met because of our interest in UFOs, absolutely. Uh, before. For, well, I guess it was right after the rebranding. We we met in either 2018 or 20, it was 2018, right? Yeah, 2019. And so, yeah, the uh, the revelations had come out. Uh, and, of course, I guess we met through our mutual friend, Robert Powell, who is, uh, had left Move On to go with the uh, SCUs. Yes. Uh, scientific Coalition for... They originally were scientific college for you. It's changed many times. Yeah. Many times. <laughs> but they, too, have, like so many, adopted the UAP moniker. And I, I get it, and I'm not against it as much as I often poo-poo it. But uh, not not their organization, but the, the, the UAP moniker. Well, it's unidentified aerial phenomena, and the government uses unidentified anomalous phenomena. And I'm... Much in pre preference of the anomalous, of course. So, um, for, I can't imagine why. Uh, but uh, and I, I think it, I think anomalous phenomena is, is a better encompassing of all the strange stuff that the UFO uh, encompasses. So, um, but whatever, it doesn't matter to me. To me, they're interchangeable. And, uh, and I wonder, my smiles, if um, SCU now stands for. Uh, unidentified aerospace phenomena. I don't I think they have they been added. I think they've developed even a bit further into aerospace. No. Uh, well, they certainly, I mean, that is obviously an area of focus. Um, uh, and now you've got me curious. I want to go to one of the, it's explore, <laughs> explore SCU. Well, everybody's got to keep up. There's been a lot of developments these last couple of years, and things uh, need to adapt and, uh, and develop right along with what we're all in these all this disclosure. You know, yeah, yeah. It is still. Oops, it's covered up. Hold on. There, thank you, Victor. Uh, Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Um, it says aerospace phenomena, though unidentified aerospace phenomena. You, uh, well, I'm, you're, you're probably, yep, I'm going right, Pat Digger, for it there. You, no, you are absolutely correct. Ta da, aerospace. You're adapting like everybody. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, well, uh, so folks can go to uh, our website, anomalyarchives.org, and find out more about the organization. That's where we post all sorts of things. Our, uh, a regular email newsletter gets posted there. You can sign up to get the email itself as a separate thing. 
or as a website alert and uh, links to all the past episodes uh, over at uh, the, go to the video tab and there's an anomaly now tab and that will take you to uh, links to all the past uh, anomaly now episodes. Uh, this one will be of course in the mix there soon enough. So, um, but yeah, this is uh, very much a UAP week. Uh, it's, it's been building for a while. Um, I even saw, I didn't put the, I didn't bring up the website, but there's a news, a sports news website called Marca. I don't know if that's an acronym for something. I, I thought it was meant Merca, but <laughs> American sports website, but even they were advertising. There's a big UAP, uh, uh briefing coming up and I'm like, wow, you know, a sports news page, but, uh, this is a uh, state.gov. Uh, from a few days ago, U.S. Space Force together expanding our competitive advantage in space. And scrolling down, eventually you can find uh, the discussion between the moderator and uh, the person giving the um, uh, uh, bre press briefing, Major General Olson, the moderator saying thank you. And the final question from Mohammed, quote, Major General Olson, what do you think about the unidentified aerial phenomena, UAP and UFOs? Major General Olson says, well, this is a very hot topic, and I appreciate the question. I know, admittedly, United Unidentified Aerial Phenomena Task Force is quite a mouthful in an acronym. I've gotten that question a couple other times. What do you think about UFOs or aliens? And quite frankly, having flown 83 different airlines and had lots of hours, we've all seen lots of unexplainable elements. Mm -hmm. And the cosmos, the space realm is so large. If we look at the Earth, it is this yada, 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 yada. Uh, so, but I think the question is actually more broadly put, and that is, is we will continue this effort. And in fact, I believe it will be getting more funding and more of a structural support level within the department. But I also believe that this is a part of our never ending quest to learn and understand and explore. And as we have on our probes, when they exited the solar system to our probes to the moon, we have gone in peace to explore and discover. This is coming from Major General. Olson. Later, another question. Uh, this is Ethan Holmes with Sputnik News Russia. <laughs> Does the U.S. Space Force maintain or plan to establish any sort of deconfliction, e uh, sort of deconfliction lines with Russia or China for the space domain as it becomes more and more strategically contested? Kind of piggybacking off of another comment you made. How does the U.S. plan to balance that civilian space cooperation? with strategic military com competition in that sphere. And secondly, all of the, and secondly, off of UAPs, is there any cooperation with allies or partners on the UAP question and probe? And Major Olson went on to say, uh, yeah, I appreciate both questions. And I'll just jump to uh, uh, the UAP thing. I think the second part of your question was related to UAP or unidentified aerial phenomena and the UAP task force. And as far as I'm concerned or am knowledgeable about that, I do believe it does involve collaborative inputs and information exchange with all kinds of countries around the globe because I think uh, because I think these are not just solely actions or events that occur within the confines of the United States. They've occurred globally, and I think we're collecting that information. We're sharing information. We view that as an open and transparent effort and activity through the United States Congress and executed by our UAP task force office. And so I would encourage greater collaboration and cooperation in that. And particularly, I think, as we see various technologies that will help demystify or debunk or clarify. But I think it's also important. One of the reasons that we're doing this effort is because national security concerns are of paramount importance and the safety of flight and deconfliction. Yada, yada, yada. Anyway, that was from the press conference leading up to today's big uh, event, um, such as it was. I didn't the, the this live stream that I watched. I, of course, I came in at the end of it and um, didn't really get to see um, uh, the all of it live. But it was up on, and this is via U.S. Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's. Uh, chair of the Senate Armed Services Committee's uh, YouTube channel. Um, and it was immediately available for restreaming. And sure enough, um, we watched a little of that today and took some notes. Here is the opening of that. The hearing will come to order. 
I'd first like to thank our witness, Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick, for testifying here and in today's earlier closed session and for his long and distinguished career, both in the intelligence community and in the Department of Defense. Dr. Kirkpatrick is the director of the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. Congress established this office in law to get to the bottom of the very serious problem of unidentified anomalous phenomenon, or UAP. Dr. Kirkpatrick has a very difficult mission. While we have made progress, there remains a stigma attached to these phenomenon. There is a vast and complex citizen engagement, and there's also very challenging scientific and technical hurdles. So we appreciate the willingness of Dr. Kirkpatrick to lean in on this issue and the work that he has accomplished thus far. And we look forward to both his opening statement and his presentation of examples of the work Arrow has done. In late 2017, media reports surfaced about activities set in motion by the late long-serving Majority Leader Senator Harry Reid more than a decade ago. We learned that there was strong evidence of advanced technology reflected in the features and performance characteristics of many objects observed by our highly, highly trained service members operating top-of-the-line military equipment. We learned that for the at least eight, the oh, objects in controlled airspace off both the east and west coast across the continental United States in test and training areas and ranges. We don't know where they are. They come from, who made them, or how they operate. As former Deputy Secretary of Defense David Norquist observed, had any of these objects had the label made in China, there would be an uproar in the government and media. There would be no stone unturned and no effort spared to find out what we were dealing with. We can look at the recent incursion of the unidentified PRC high altitude balloon for, as an example. And But because of the UFO stigma... And just to jump uh, quickly to the slide, I started to show there um what you'll see on the right uh, a histogram of all of our reported sightings as a function of altitude so most of our sightings occur in the 15 to 25,000 foot range and that is ultimately because that's where a lot of our aircraft are on the far right upper corner you'll see a breakout of the morphologies of all of the UAP that are reported. Over half, about 52% of what's been reported to us, are round or spheres. The rest of... So this is a just about an hour-long uh, briefing. Not anything, any huge revelations, um, but I do want to touch on a couple of things. And first... Uh, Mark, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you had the chance to, to, to watch the whole thing. And I'm curious at what highlights you might have found most interesting to your sensibilities. No, I didn't watch the whole interview. Um, just to back up a little bit, I will say I was in a room in some very long meetings today with some environmental scientists. And these hearings came up today. So this is very much being talked about across disparate groups. I did not know these folks well enough to bring the topic up myself, but it was brought up by then. So this this was a big deal. Uh, this was on the radar of many folks today, apparently. Um, also, I would add, just go back to the General Olson, Olson's interview before this meeting. If you read the article, he, he very oddly, he mentions the red phone to Russia. And he says, you know, he puts that in there. And he says, look, for um, critical topics such as this, we have established the red phone, essentially, that's used for nuclear crises and all kinds of other things. But he was implying that... Um, that level of communication between leadership, you know, is is very much within this topic or phenomena that they're they're ready to use the red phone if need be. Thought that was pretty interesting. Um, um, Gabbard's met, you know, uh, I think she makes a good point in, in the clip that you showed about the fact that had these had made in China, you know, this would be, as she's saying, no rock would be left unturned or whatnot. So. And we, you know, you tailed off and switched right as she is about to say that the stigma associated with this is the only thing that's keeping us from getting real answers. And so I think there's a stigma issue that's this last little bit of, um, uh, you know, it's the, it's the last little bit that needs to get removed before some real progress can be made. And she's I mean, she's bringing that to light. And I think that's really important to for her to mention the stigma um, so that we can all start processing that and hopefully these lawmakers, et cetera, you know, can get through that themselves internally so they can start behaving differently and making different decisions, you know. 
Yeah, I know. I'm glad you reminded me of that. And, and yeah, I did. He was just about to get to that. And, um, the, something else that comes up that's very important to this and that wasn't in, in the initial charge, uh, and I'm glad to hear repeatedly mentioned, is uh, the need for a whistleblower process. Um, I don't have the clips queued up for that, but um, it's touched on repeatedly. And uh, Gillibrand uh, specifically says, you know, how long till you get some kind of web portal where people can uh, do this? And they, they link it in, as has been mentioned in by us and reporting on the media's mentioning of it that this is a charge to go back to at least as well to as far back as for formerly 1947 now to 1945 and that it's not just about uh you know reassessing the hundreds thousands tens of thousands hundreds of thousands millions who knows how many sighting events mm -hmm. um but uh to, to, as uh, Kirkpatrick says later on, to get a real sense of the history of what's been going on. And so, and they seem to be linking that again to this need to get insiders to speak out. And um, honestly, that's kind of the area where I was expecting both the least likely to anything significant to happen and that, that part of the charge probably just kind of be brushed aside. Uh, or worst case scenario, my paranoid conspiratorial side is like, that's, that's the way that they're going to roll out the real d disinformation. <laughs> you know, they're going to have some pre-made whistleblowers to, to break open something that's just, you know, may or may not actually be true. Um, more credible there, Bob Lazar maybe. Yeah. Yes. Um, and there are some very, some more interesting things in here. I think I might be able to queue up. Another one. Oh, so they they touch on two different sightings, uh, and I, I I'll play a bit of the first bit here. Oops, hold on. Got to get it back up on the screen there. <laughs> uh, dang it! And there we go. True. Two cases that we've uh, declassified recently. Um, this first one is an MQ-9 in the Middle East observing that blow-up, which is an apparent spherical object via EO sensors. Those are not IR. If you want to go ahead and click that and play it, you'll see it uh, come through the top of the screen. There it goes. And then the camera will slew to follow it. You'll see it pop in and out of the field of view there. This is essentially all of the data we have associated with this event from some years ago. It is going to be virtually impossible to fully identify that just based off of that video. And what we can do and what we are doing is keeping that as part of that group of 52% to see what are the similarities? What are the trends across all of these? Do we see these in a particular distribution? Do they all behave the same or not? As we get more data, we will be able to go back and look at these in a fuller context. How are we going to get more data? We are working with the joint staff to issue guidance to all the services and commands that will then establish what are the reporting requirements, the timeliness, and all of the data that is required to be delivered to us and retained from all of the associated sensors? Yes. And so there, I, I think he, uh, Kirkpatrick does a really pretty dang good job. Uh, I agree. And he's being very methodical. He obviously is skilled, I think, at, at speaking in front of these audiences, even if it's a little slow and obviously deliberate, but uh, given the the nature of the material, and again, like you said, she was trying to get make a point about trying to get past the ridicule factor, and um, uh, it's 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 so it's it's good to not make missteps at this point. Um, uh, there's a lot in the uh, in the the text. Uh, they talk about the different uh, methodologies using two different teams, red team, blue team, uh, intelligence analysts who are good with sensor data. Um, and 
there's a lot of interesting revelations. I think at some point he mentions um, the fact that he was apparently consulted about those three objects that were shot down that crazy weekend. Um, I, I forget exactly how much he, he was involved in that, but he did say that he was contacted by DOD about that. And of course, that was part of the concern. And several people were speaking out saying, hey, I thought they were supposed to be a, a part of these kinds of discussions. Um, I think I have another little clip here. Let's see. So as of this week, uh, we are tracking over a total of 650 cases. Now, uh, the report in January basically said about half of the ones at that time, about 150, were balloon, were likely balloon-like or something like that. That doesn't mean they're resolved. Oh, I see. Okay, so what, uh, let me, let me walk everyone through what our analytic process looks like. We have a, essentially a five-step process, right? So we have, we get our cases in with all the data. We create a case uh, for that uh, event. My team does a preliminary scrub of all of those cases as they come in just to sort out, do we have any information that says this is in one of those likely categories? It's likely a balloon, it's likely a balloon, you know, a bird, it's likely some other object. Or we don't know. Then we prioritize those based off of where they are. Are they attached to a national security area? Does it show some anomalous um, phenomenology that is of interest? If it's just if it's just a spherical thing that's floating around with the with the wind and it has no payload on it, that's going to be less important than something that has a payload on it, which will be less important than something that's maneuvering, right? So there's there's sort of a hierarchy of just binning the priorities because we can't do all of them at once. Yes. Once we do that and we prioritize them, we take that package of data in that case, and I have set up two teams. Uh, think of this as a red team, blue team, or a competitive analysis. I have an intelligence community team made up of intelligence analysts, and I have an S&T team made up of scientists and engineers and the people that actually build a lot of these sensors or physicists, because, you know, if you're a physicist, you can do anything, right? Um, and... But they're not associated with the uh, Intel community. They're, they're not Intel officers. So they, they look at this through the lens of the sensor of the, the, what the data says. We give that package to both teams. The intelligence community is going to look at it through the lens of the intelligence record and, and what they assess and their Intel tradecraft, which they have very specific rules and regulations on how they do that. Scientific community, technical community is going to look at it through the lens of what is the data telling me? What is the sensor doing? What would I expect a sensor response to be? And back that out. Those two groups give us their answers. We then adjudicate. If they agree, then I am more likely to close that case if they agree on what it is. If they disagree, we will have an adjudication. We'll bring them together. We'll take a look at the differences. We'll adjudicate. What? Why do you say one thing and you say another? And it later on, um, he goes into uh, great pains to say just because we um, uh, say that it's it's balloon like doesn't mean that it's a case closed. And uh, he talks about uh, this prioritizing of anomalous interesting value, and do we have more data to make a determination? All of which harkens back to. We've been here before. It's called Blue Book. And yeah. while, you know, everybody, you know, and myself included, you know, proposed Blue Book as being it was just there to, you know, debunk and uh, assuage fears. The point that they also made was they ended up having many, many, many unknowns. But those, their rationalization was, well, we don't have enough information to draw a conclusion that we feel confident we can back. Though I think back then they were much more quick to uh, feel like they could they could back something uh, if it if it debunks something, um, uh, so very interesting stuff. I know it's a little slow pace. But... You know, it, it's funny, Smiles. 
it's we're still in a state where you have to kind of get lucky to have a sensor encounter a UAP phenomenon, right? I mean, well, there's hot spots. He pointed them out in their infograph or their chart that he put up, which, by the way, compared to what Blue Book generated, this office, Aero office, that deliverable, so to speak, that he was showing, there's a lot in that. If you unpack that, it's showing that they've fully accepted these things and they're, they're, they're generating analysis, something that Blue Book certainly didn't do. Heineck did, of course, but, you know, in terms of the overall program and what deliverables they may have gained citizens of the U.S., for example. But anyway, you know, it's like by chance still. And so when he says we need to get data synergy across the various departments and then also the branches of the military, then you also have to have synergy of instrumentation, verification, and you need multiple data sets to overlap over the top of each other of different data types. So you have radar and you have infrared and they have satellite data. The real question for the Aero Office is going to be, how do you generate rapid deployment of sensors once a UAP is identified? What sensors do you have in the area? How fast can they get there? You know, what is that collaboration and what does that response time look like? You know, it, it's going to be a real challenge. I mean, certainly if they're the ones that are, know what they have. So I'm sure I'm obviously I'm not aware. None of us are aware of the suite of sensors and cameras out there that they can rapidly deploy to one point on the globe to try to get multiple data sets generated but that's really the challenge they have in front of them you know and, and otherwise it's just going to be luck or by chance um anyway that's it, it that's that's the real challenge and he he does um he does at some point address um the process that they're and he says i think that they're going to roll it out in the next few weeks because i think uh Gillibrin kind of asks the question to to your point and and obviously, I think the way they're approaching it, it it's not going to I don't think they're going to have that rapid deployment kind of uh, ability. It's going to be, well, we already have these amazing, expensive sensors that are all part of our national defense. So it's now incumbent on this office to create the workflow to siphon that up. And it's almost always going to be after the fact. I don't think they go so far as to say it, but I mean, that's going to be more often than not, you know, I don't think there's going to be that. I mean, when, when, when the military isn't intercepting an unknown, it ain't going to be like, well, let's, let's mull over, you know, is it, it's, I mean, they're mulling over if it's friend or foe, but it's like, it's more important to be ready for it to be a foe than to call the arrow office, you know? Uh, but maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe there's uh, some is there really a kind of rapid deployment that is available to him. For example, if uh, a, a fighter jet pilot sees an object and he's over the ocean, in he, he's Air Force, you know, if there's a mechanism in place where they can have the Navy ships turn on their radars in an area because they have long range, now you're getting the radar signature plus the infrared. You know, so it's a matter of that departmental co cooperation. You can get a kind of rapid deployment if you have the assets in the area. It's just a matter of communication. I think it's rapid communication exercise probably as much as anything, at least at this point. That's a good point. And and satellites. <laughs> and satellites, you know, turn turn the eye. You know, the eye of Sauron can look anywhere it wants. You know, we got lots of uh, we got lots of satellites. So that's right. If we have a satellite with a fighter jet pilot tailing something and we got a ship that flicks on its radar, you know, now we're talking. But I, yeah, it's an exercise in rapid communication deployment, I suppose. I think I want to play maybe a little bit, just a tiny bit more of this. And before we move on, um, let me see if I can get this going here. So that's a great question. Part of what we have to do as we go through these, um, especially the ones that show signatures of advanced technical capabilities, is determine if there's a foreign nexus. That's really hard if what we observe doesn't have a Chinese or Russian flag on the side of it. Now, I think it is um, prudent to say of the, of the cases that are showing it, you know, some sort of advanced technical signature, of which we're talking single percentages of the entire population of cases we have. Um, I am concerned about 
what that nexus is. And I have indicators that some are related to foreign capabilities. We have to investigate that with our IC partners. And as we get evidence to support that, that gets then handed off to the appropriate IC agency to investigate. Again, it becomes an SEP at that point. Somebody else's problem. Right. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, folks, uh, we'll we'll provide the link. Uh, it's it's via uh, uh, Senator Gillibrand's YouTube channel. I'm sure there's other copies out there on on other YouTube channels. Um, but uh, let's. It's it's a very interesting. I, I I think I was saying before the show to to Mark. Um, I actually, I feel like I've got a better feeling about this. Uh, than I did going into it. <laughs> I really was not expecting much out of this uh, this briefing um, and this this new office. Um, oh, and I just I will uh, the one other thing I'll I'll mention is uh, when asked about his interfacing with the academic community. Of course, there's been this paper that's been uh, making news that involves uh, him, Kurt Patrick and Avi Loeb that's being probably, I would not misrepresented, misinterpreted as implying that it's probable that there's some mothership, some alien mothership in the solar system deploying uh, probes in the form of UAP uh, when in fact it was just them collaborating on the idea of this being a possibility, not that they were trying to argue that that's actually what's happening. Um, but she, uh, the, one of the, uh, 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 politicos asked the question, you know, about academic community interfacing and, uh, lo and behold, surprise, 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 Kirkpatrick quotes Carl Sagan, uh, his, his thing about extraordinary claims requiring extraordinary evidence. But, um, I think, uh, Kirkpatrick's response was something to the effect of, no, actually it needs even more. Um, so he's, I think. We was trying to play that skeptic card there at the very end, I, I suspect. But um, something in, more interesting or something equally interesting that has come out in the last few days is this article over at curiosmos.com. Uh, and I haven't really had the chance to digest this. Uh, Sentient unveiled the, this highly classified AI can quote unquote see and detect UFOs. This is from uh, curiosmos.com and uh, is from just uh, earlier this month. According to a series of partially declassified documents, a highly classified AI system is capable of seeing and detecting UFOs unlike any other AIs in existence. Sentient differs in the degree of independence. Usually the algorithm works with loaded information, but Sentient can even detect satellites, excuse me, can even direct satellites to obtain images of the objects it needs. Um, and... Uh, as I say, I haven't had the chance really to digest this, but I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, development. I'm, I'm assuming it's referring to documents and covered. I think it even cites John Greenwald at the Black yes. Vault. Yes. Did Did you have a chance to look at, look at this a little cursory? Um, cursory, but yeah, uh, Greenwald's mentioned the Black Vault. There were some emails uh, by a FOA that were released about this. Um, including a PowerPoint presentation that was pretty heavily redacted. But if you folks can find this via the link um, through through the you know through the anomaly archives here and what Miles has set up, this is well worth your time. You know, AI is a subject that's you know at the forefront. We have Elon Musk, you know, doing an interview the last couple of days with Tucker Carlson uh, talking about the dangers of AI. This, on the other hand, is um, I, you know not that type of AI, but um, Basically, it's an algorithm. Um, it doesn't say much about how it would work. What they do say, however, is that the model or the algorithm resides within this AI capability. And they're talking about it simply just needs to be turned on. So it looks like it's a technology that's staged. In fact, in the article, they talk about the fact that it's been used um, to kind of hone in on a few objects via satellites that end up being tic tac shaped. So it has been used and it's verified um, shapes by satellite imagery of, of other Tic Tacs that aren't being talked about. And, and that was uh, 
that was via this forward too. So a lot, a lot to unpack. So use this link um, and all this work, this footwork that Miles has done to bring these articles to the forefront. And you know, you're click away from really getting to the kind of the bleeding edge uh, of where the AI is starting to intersect this phenomenon and this topic. It's fascinating to say the least. Um, and there's lots of nuggets in there. I'm going back to reread it myself, actually. So. Yeah, and there's there's links in the article to the the Black Malt yeah. uh, FOIA requested articles and his uh, John Greenwald's videos on uh, his analysis of that. Shifting yeah. gear. Oh, uh, The Hill has this great article. I think there was a link in one of the other articles, but it's 10 key questions for this week's, week's historic UFO hearing. Oh, right. And that that right there, that is a... That's a great article. Again, we'll have a link to that most likely, but there's lots of sublinks you know, that where you can hover over words, and the Hill is really great at this. So they got this Hill article, and then they have words that have underlines underneath them. You can click on those words, and the the authors of this article give you links to all the the, the critical words and topics. Um, yeah, there you go. Thanks, Miles. I mean, this is this is just a great article. You can get in here, start hitting all these little links, and it's really going to start building a picture for you in terms of you know where we're at, um, who the players are, what the technologies are, etc. This is a this is a great link and well worth everybody's time. Uh, thank you for reminding me of that that article. Uh, yeah. I'd originally uh, suggested we might uh, check that out. Um, so shifting gears, um, th weird things seen in the sky. Uh, I've, this has been causing me flashbacks to, uh, ever since January. But so this is from uh, April 17th. This, uh, I guess it's a photography website, petapixel.com. Giant spiral appears amid the aurora lights in Alaska's night sky. I mean, that is just gorgeous. This over by the top. Is, that's a rocket booster causes that. Well, you know, you and I can say that. <laughs> But there's tons of people who do not believe, um, and I and it it just blows my mind. Uh, that is you know, beautiful. it is beautiful. This is this is a great uh, a great example of this. And of course, yes, this is a SpaceX launch uh, recorded, I believe, from this map. I think indicates all the way from uh, down in California, south of San Francisco, all the way up to uh, Alaska. Uh, and it, it, of course, mentioned that, oh, yeah, by the way, back uh, in January, uh, there was another one. Uh, but here's another, here's an AP rocket science Alaska sky uh, spiral caused by SpaceX fuel dump. Um, beautiful, beautiful photos there. Um, but, you know, this uh, also, again, this is the, and then harkens back to January. Uh, this one here, I think this will work. Let's see. Hold on. <laughs> no, so, no, 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 no. I love it when a plan doesn't come t together. <laughs> Here we go. Uh, I need to share that and then do that and then... Mystery solved. Now, this past Wednesday, the Subaru telescope on Mauna Kea captured video of this mysterious light over Hawaii. Check it out. That's great. It's moving. Not a UFO, they confirmed. It turns out that the so-called flying spiral is actually a new satellite that was launched earlier that day by SpaceX. Sure, it launched all sorts of theories, so thanks to that for clearing up. Speaking of Sauron. <laughs> exactly, yes. Uh, blue <laughs> eyes. Of course, and what this really causes me a flashback is to uh, 2009. Uh, and this is an article that I wrote back in December 2009 uh, that was part of a, the Anomaly magazine that I was writing for and publishing at the time. And uh, what I wrote then, on the eve of Obama's Nobel Prize acceptance visit, a mesmerizing white spiral vortex accompanied by a beautiful blue plume has been recorded and reported by numerous sources across Norway. Thus, the Norway spiral. Amazing pictures are pouring in as well as several videos that are going viral as we type this message. The aerial occurrences are getting lots of discussion across the internet. Could the Stargate-like display be connected to the Large Hadron Collider? No. Uh, is it a dimensional doorway into other realms? Not really, except into people's beliefs. Uh, is it a public publicity stunt presaging the arrival of President Obama? Mm. 
Uh, so far, the consensus seems to be it is the result of a failed Russian missile test, which Russia has now confirmed. The pictures would show the most distinct spiral form at first seem to be the most likely to have been photoshopped. Yet, there are already scientifically modeled CGI videos that would seem to vindicate the spiral's plausible rocket science origins. In fact, the photos and video footage seem very familiar, and after doing a little scribbling, yesterday afternoon I found the footage which was causing my pseudo-deja vu. Unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, yeah, this video is long gone because this is over at video.google.com, which does not exist anymore. Uh, it seems that a very similar phenomenon was recorded and similarly swept the net by storm just a few years ago. The footage was allegedly from Tomsk in Russia circa either 2006 or 2007. Oh, and I don't think either of these videos is going to play, but just quickly. Nope, unavailable. Yeah, anyway, uh, speculation then as now was that this was a Russian missile test. That appears to be the most sound explanation so far with the Norway spiral. And then I linked to another video. Um, but if you recall, these were these were just amazing. Uh, the video footage from this 2009 event was phenomenal. It was just fantastic and, um, uh, and, and had this crazy corkscrew going up to it. I mean, it was just, and, and so many people, many of my conspiracy, conspiracy oriented friends would not accept that this was a, that the explanation of a, uh, um, a rocket launch, a failed rocket launch right. that was, was at play. Um, uh, and this of course is not the first time that a, a rocket launch was associated with, with concomitant uh, UFO sightings or the perception of a, a unidentified <laughs> vortex object. Uh, but yeah, this, this was just uh, an amazing, I wish I could find, I hadn't, hadn't had a chance to really find the video from this, but these photos that I had posted uh, kind of give you that sense of it. You know, these, these images are so incredible that, you know, if look at that one, for example, I mean, if you're an unsophisticated kind of day to day, go to work, put your feet up, feet up, watch TV kind of person, you let your dog out in the backyard and you're seeing this and you're not aware of the you yeah. know, aerospace industry and whatnot. This can be very concerning. I wouldn't Heck be surprised yeah. if this was very scary, frankly, for a lot of folks, you know, yeah. I mean, this is unprecedented, frankly, you know, these sort of images. So, I mean, I'm sure... Th I'm sure a lot of people were, forgive my French, scared shitless. I mean, I've been yeah. a big deal. Well, and the, and so it just it 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 is surprising to me when you know, twice this year, and it's going to happen more and more because again, as we launch, as there's more commercial uh, space uh, exploration, space industry, these kinds of things are going to become. It's just like with the Starlink and all the misidentifications. Like, oh my God, there was a fleet of UFOs all in a straight line, and they went the same speed. Yeah. It's like. Yeah, that's called Starlink. Um, but yeah, if you're not familiar with these things, they could, and if you're, God forbid, you're, you're, you know, on the edge ecologically, you, it could unhinge somebody. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. But this freaking beautiful, and and uh, these recent uh, uh, recent ones, uh, I think, is just interesting and always make me flash back to um, 2009. Mm. Um, yeah, you know, some uh, just totally shifting gears now, <laughs> and we are you know we're going a little long tonight, but I'm going to cram a little bit here quickly in at the end. Um, I you know I've lived here all, all my life uh, since kindergarten, and as long as I've been watching weather radar, I've I and people I've been sitting there watching it with as storms approached Austin have been wondering what the hell's going on. It's like there's this invisible rain dome yeah. around Austin. And if you if you've not lived here, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But um as this uh meteorologist says, after 30 plus years of them being a meteorologist in central Texas, um you you've seen these patterns and uh, finally somebody has an explanation that actually is very akin to my own sense of this, but they got more scientifically grounded figuratively and literally. Um, I've always speculated when watching these weather radars, as you'll see like the weather 
uh, pattern approaching, you know, uh, Austin and the, 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 the storm system that just looks like it's about to just barrel across Austin. It always just kind of splits up yeah, or dissipates and then re solidifies on the other side, uh, going West to East when it goes across IH 35 interstate highway 35. And as some friend of mine many, many years ago said, well, you know, the, 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 the fault line, the I-35 follows the fault line. And so thus the, 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 the joke here, Austin's invisible rain dome is all Balcony's fault. There's the Balcony's fault line. And here is a uh, video that kind of, you can't quite get it, but here's Austin in the center. And it's just like the, 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 uh, in this case, and was it south, southwest to northeast uh, flow of this just kind of goes around and, you know, I mean, that's not to say we've, we've, we've gotten tons of crazy flooding, uh, huge rainstorms, a couple of tornadoes never touched down, but, you know, occasionally uh, tornadoes tear uh, across us. But um, this person is suggesting that it's because of the Balcony fault line. But, and of course, when I was thinking of this, I'm thinking, you know, oh, electromagnetics, piezoelectric uh you know factors and maybe that's at play here as well but this person is just focusing on elevation <laughs> uh and the balcony's escarpment uh that that uh uh tectonic zone there and i'm probably using all the wrong words here but anyway i just found this very interesting uh to finally see a meteorologist uh attempting to to find an explanation for this strange phenomena that many of us locals have seen for so many, so many years, but not very anomalous, except that it seems anomalous when you're watching it. You're like, Oh, we're about to get hit by rain. Well, there are a lot of construction workers over the years that are watching these radars and they're just, they're going, I'm staying home today. This is, this is going to be great. I'm going to get a day (laughs) off. And then they watch the radar. Like you gotta be kidding me. Yep. (laughs) It just splits around. (laughs) Yep. Um, all right. Now this is going to be fast and furious folks. Uh, Victor, our, uh, technician, uh, uh, sent me, I already had a couple of, of weird creature links, but, um, uh, Victor sent us a, a ton of other ones. So real quick here, I'm not going to focus on these and we'll put them all in the show notes. So, uh, when we uh, repost everything but here we go folks over at express.co.uk locals baffled as alien like sea creature with spiked tail found on uk beach maryland came across the alien like animal while taking a stroll along a beach in west sussex this is from april 11th and you can see uh this this image of this creature here it almost to me it looks like a like a crocodile from the from the top or an alligator you know some kind of so reptilian with maybe its head here and tail on the right side. I don't know. Um, I don't I think there's any other pictures in this one, but we're going to start off with that one on April 11th. Well, if we shift over to uh, April 12th, we've got Mystery Loch Ness Fish Sets New Orleans Fisherman a Buzz. Here is a quick video of this th- crazy thing. There's no reason to go in the ocean. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of reasons apparently not to. It's got lips and teeth. What is that? It, it just nothing surprises me when they say something came out of the ocean. We don't know what it is. It's like, yeah, the, of course. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, this one's, uh, like I say, this is over at newsweek.com. Oh, and they've got some giant fish there. Oh, great. Cool. They're going to nibble on your toes. Uh, Meanwhile, uh, Yahoo News uh, has shared this Kansas City Star endangered hellbender dad that's found fathering eggs in Missouri River. He's made history. Uh, So this male salamander called the hellbender, in the eyes of Missouri wildlife officials, the world's best dad is an endangered hellbender who was found fathering 128 eggs in the fall. Um, Oops, got to unblock all that. Oh, some eggs. Oh, goody. Uh, so this, this salamander, yay. How many of y'all have ever come across something like that? Never seen anything like that. 
Uh, then over at uh, uh, fieldandstream.com is uh, something very much that we've heard about a lot here in Texas. Alabama Wildlife Freshwater Fisheries Division identifies strange-looking chupacabra, quote-unquote. And it's, excuse me, chupacabras. There's an S on the end, even when it's singular, folks. Let's try to pronounce these things correctly. And, hey, is that a coyote with mange? Yeah, yeah, I wonder. So, yeah, uh, Elmen, the Elmendorf Beast and other uh, Texas Blue Dogs were uh, the various names that the chupacabras uh, had gotten here in central Texas. Uh, again, largely the result of poor creatures, various creatures. I think there's been uh, coyotes with mange. I think yes. there's been uh, dogs with mange. There's also, I think, been raccoons with mange identified, misidentified as mystery creatures. And yes, they do look kind of mysterious and scary, and it's more sad than anything. Um, uh, but... Um, Another mystery creature. Meanwhile, over at the Houston Chronicles website, cron.com, bizarre sea creature washes ashore on Bolivar, unsettling Texas beachgoers. Uh-oh. Should I keep scrolling, folks? I don't... <laughs> what kind of crazy creature? Uh, to this oh, no. Uh, God, that looks like some kind of weird, just a, a random mouth on the beach. What is that? Um... Yeah, so uh, I don't know if they have to wear shoes if you go in the ocean. Yes, uh, wear those little water shoes or uh, shoes. Ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, and again, that was from uh, this one. I haven't been doing These are all in, in day. This is from like April 11th through April 17th. So these are like just bam, bam, bam. There's been just one of these after another strange creatures in the news. This one from Houston Chronicle, cron.com. And lastly, uh, Yahoo News reproduces this, uh, I think, local news reporting. I'm not sure for more. Bizarre discovery on Aussie Beach stuns locals. What is it? And in this case, I, I don't know if I should say what it looks like. What does that look like to you? A, a mushroom. It looks like a mushroom. That's what I'm going to say. Um, and there, uh, here's some speculation as to what it might actually be, which seems to be more of a coral-like creature. Like something that lives on coral, um, yeah. perhaps. Anyway, we'll we'll provide the links to these. You can dive as far into this weirdness as you want, folks. Appreciate the link, Victor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, thank you, Victor, for adding the the, the nice taste of strangeness to the the, the show. There, uh, mystery creatures are great. Cryptids of all sorts. You know, just you know, some of them are things that you've just never seen. Um. Well, thank you all so much for yeah. joining us on this Good long fun. edition. I'm glad we went long tonight, Smiles. Yeah, man, it, uh, it's nice to, to cover so much fun and interesting stuff. There's a lot going uh, on for a change. So, yeah. um, well, thank you all for joining us. This has been uh, myself, Smiles Lewis, and my co-host Mark Jackson. You guys have a great night. Hit those links. Smiles puts a Smiles puts a lot of work into them, and it's it's right there. It's a click away. Um, just a uh, it's a great service in twenty years of providing as much again congratulations smiles it's great thank you thank you and uh we'll be back next week take care see you everybody